Welcome back. It is my true pleasure to introduce Steve Greenberg. He is a Grammy award-winning record executive and producer. He has helped launch the careers of Hanson, the Jonas Brothers, Joss Stone, Andy Grammer, AJR, and so many more. His, he's here to talk about his newest project called The Speed of Sound, and we are absolutely thrilled. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Oh, this is, this is so much fun. So, you know, for all of our viewers out there, I've been uh, talking with Steve while Lauren's been getting, if you noticed, Lauren's video was up and down because her computer busted. So it gave me a great chance to get to know Steve a little bit and talk with him about his career. So Steve, some of the highlights, I mean, you have so many highlights, but tell me a little bit about, um, you know, you've done a lot of trios, like a boy band trios, right? So tell me a little bit about some of the great experiences you had working with Jonas Brothers say, that's a really great household name. Well, the Jonas Brothers were uh, great guys for starters. They just came from a great family and they're nice people. And that always is a requirement, right? If you're gonna be in a working relationship with people. But, um, you know, I guess um, my favorite story about the Jonas Brothers is that they almost didn't happen. They almost didn't exist. When I, I, I went to Columbia Records in 2005 as president of the label, and they handed me a pile of CDs of acts that they were going to drop from the label. And they said, hey, before we drop these labels, sorry, I'm sorry, before we drop these acts, um, why don't you go through this pile and maybe there's something there that you don't want us to drop or you want to take a second look at or whatever. And in the pile, there was this CD from this boy named Nicholas Jonas. And I put it on, and it was a Christian pop record, actually. And I didn't think it was a very good record, but his voice was so great. And almost more importantly, his voice reminded me of the voice of Taylor Hansen, the lead singer of Hansen, who I'd worked with a few years earlier. And I thought, boy, anybody who can sing like Taylor Hansen is worth meeting. You know? So yeah. I brought him in for a meeting before they dropped him. And in the course of the meeting, he said that he had brothers. I said, brothers? Wait a second. I, I know how to do that. <laughs> I said, I said do, you, do you guys know how to play instruments and he said well we're learning how to play instruments now i know that like you take a bunch of young guys teenage guys uh and and they say they're learning to play instruments that pretty much means they can learn to play their instruments if they put their mind to it you know so i said i said great you're a band <laughs> you know <laughs> and so that's actually how the jonas brothers became a band was um because he had brothers and I liked the idea of working with a brother act and they were learning to play instruments. And I said, that's good enough for me. You can be a band. And um, we, you know, we put out some great, great songs with them. And uh, they of course went on to superstardom, which then they're still at the, at the top of the world today. It is so amazing to hear those stories because we've all felt, you know, every single one of us has felt like if I only had a chance, like if I, if I only had that chance where like someone believed in me, like, I would, I could do this or I could work so hard. And, and I think that's so amazing that you had that talent to be able to, to see something that other people didn't see and take a chance on them. Really well, it's, very, it's very easy to not see things working. If, if something new comes in and it hasn't hit yet and it's an unknown thing, it's very easy to imagine it failing because most things, right. fail, you know, so, so the, the, the real thing is to, is to sort of say that you're, committed to bucking those odds and even though most things fail if you have something you believe in you've got to just kind of go for it and say I, I think this one out of a hundred can succeed you know and, and that's what happened with the Jonas Brothers and a lot of other things I mean Hanson uh, got turned down by over a dozen record labels before I signed it um, mm -hmm. when I, I did Who Let the Dogs Out many years ago I was going to do it for a, a record label owned by the Warner Music Group and they hated the record I had a little deal with them put out records and they hated the record so much that I walked out of the whole deal and started my own record company to put the record out because they refused to even put it out. They thought it was so That's so bad. crazy. And like that, everyone knows that song. Truly. Years, people still know it. Yeah. 
Oh, but we still have to ask the question. And then I really do want to make a comment about Steve and his life, because what he does, he makes it look so stinking easy, yeah. like, as if you could just identify talent walking down the street. But <laughs> he's had a lifetime of listening to music and watching bands and recording. And I mean, Steve, I've known you since what, we were 15. And you have always, always just had music in your in your whole spirit it's always been that way so the opportunity to really do what you're doing now i mean you were just born for this it's amazing I'm, I'm and sure the dogs it. part though i need to know like who let the dogs out go ahead so, tell us so, you know there's a whole movie about this um there's a movie <laughs> that you can see i think it's on amazon or some, something um called who let the dogs out and it's a documentary about the song and, and its crazy history. And we never really do answer the question, pull the dogs out. But I will say that Isaiah Taylor, who's the leader of the Baja men who had the hit with the song, says it was me. So I'm- oh, You let the dogs out, they are the dogs, and yeah. you let them out. Well, if we listen to the podcast, the podcast kind of lets us in on who does the barking dog. So I'd say that's the person who let the dogs out. That is true. I actually like was in the studio with the Baja men and they were great singers, but they were very weak barkers. And I knew that the bark was a crucial part of the song to make it a hit. And I couldn't get them to bark the way I wanted. So I kind of gave them an example of what I wanted. And uh, they said, okay, like Mr. Smart Alec, if you think you're such a good barker, why don't you just do it yourself? I said, okay, I will. And I did it. Uh, and that, that, that actually proved to be an especially good move on my part. I didn't know it at the time, but you know, it turns out that when you perform as a vocalist, on something that's on television, you get uh, after royalties like from the from the actors union, the, the screen yeah. actors for TV. So um, every time a movie or something that has who let the dogs out and it gets shown on TV, they send me a small check. So it's like really funny that I that's make that good money for the last twenty years barking, which I never anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. You know, that's funny. My dad um, is as uh, I think most of our viewers know, had a background in entertainment. And every once in a while, we'll get an after check for like five bucks. And it's like, oh, it's a nice. <laughs> Don't spend it all in one place. Exactly, exactly. That's so so Steve, you're up, to, you're up to something new. So why a podcast? So, you know, I, I think over the years, I've kind of come up with a lot of ideas about how pop music phenomena happen. Like what takes something and makes it go from zero to massively popular in a very short time. So my podcast, which is called Speed of Sound, examines exactly that. Like how did how did how did something, whether it's a group or a song or a whole type of music, how did that happen? Like, you know, we, we hear things and once we hear them and they become hits, it seems like they, it was inevitable that they would be hits. You know, you think of the Beatles today and you think, Oh yeah, of course, they're so great. Like, how could anyone great. not know that the Beatles right. are the greatest? Yeah. But the funny thing about the Beatles is that Capitol Records in America passed on the Beatles multiple times. Like they were sent from me to you and please, please me and she loves you and I want to hold your hand. And they just kept passing, you know, huh. it took a whole chain of events for that not to have actually derailed their career in the U.S. And a lot of things kind of had to go right and some things that went wrong proved to be uh, good things in the end, even though they seemed like bad things, like mistakes turned out to be good mistakes. And uh, so that's what the whole podcast is about. There's, there actually is a whole episode of the podcast about how the Beatles went from being completely unknown to getting the biggest audience in the history of American television when they um, television show in 1964. How they did that in the course of six weeks. And they went from zero to that in six weeks. And so the whole series is like that. There's one episode about how the Sugar Hill Gang introduced rap to the whole world when they put out Rapper's Delight. There was an episode on Who Let the Dogs Out. There are two great episodes about the twist and yeah. how the twist really changed American popular culture and the way we think about how we're allowed to move in public. That is fascinating. And, uh, and, and I'm just finishing up this week. We just finished up um, four episodes on the rise and fall of 70s disco. Oh my gosh. Me to do. Do you think that there is a resurgence in the 70s disco? It feels like there's a resurgence right now of kind of four on the floor dance music. So it's I hard. think the elements of that sound are coming back into the mainstream. I've had a bunch of conversations about this with people recently, actually. And I think that everyone agrees that there is a hunger 
for sort of happy, up-tempo music that you could party to, that you could celebrate to. And I think that we're probably a minute away from a return of that kind of music. Um, I'm not saying it's disco, it's just music that's up-tempo and, uh -huh. and, and happy as opposed to the music at the moment, which not surprisingly is kind of mid-tempo and a little bit bummed out. And yeah. I, think, I think everyone is like, anxious for this kind of happier music to come back but we're not quite ready for it yet. yeah you know what i mean like we still the world has to get a little better before we can actually feel good about I agree. But, we're, but we're anxious for that to come and mm -hmm. i think that somewhere in 2021 we're going to see a very poppy happy moment in music yeah i hope so there there have been little bits and pieces where i felt like maybe there's a little bit of a disco flavor like like Selena Gomez's Bad Liar, for example. I love that vibe. And uh, Pharrell Williams, Happy, of course. You know, there's just like a little bit of that in there. And I'm like, oh, I hope it comes back. Because I always have enjoyed it. Yeah, Blinding Lights by the weekend has a little bit of that with a form. Yep, there's a bunch of things. So, uh, you know, all these musics, they come and go. And, but they leave traces of themselves behind all the time. Yeah. And it came before, always in form, it comes uh, next. And then the next episode of the podcast, I look at the Monster Mash. Oh. It's a completely great story. That's why I'm doing an episode on the Monster Mash because it's a truly fascinating story. Oh. And, um, it, you know, it turns out that the Monster Mash is a parody of a record that no one really remembers anymore. And the lyrics of the Monster Mash are addressing a really big fad in America for uh, movie monsters that was massive, massive, massive at that moment that doesn't exist anymore either. So it's a parody of a song that we don't remember, addressing a fad that nobody remembers anymore. But for some reason, everybody knows the Monster Man. <laughs> and, and that episode has is, is got, I have a special treat in that episode because I interviewed, as part of talking about the whole monster craze in America in the early 60s, I interviewed Butch Patrick, who played Eddie Munster on The Munsters. No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Incredible. It's really fun. So it, it, that, that's a real good episode. And then I've got an episode coming up also on uh, the return of teen pop in the late 90s after the grunge era. You know, music was very dark and very alternative. And then all of a sudden, between the Spice Girls and Hanson and the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and Britney, all of a sudden there was just this deluge of bright, happy pop for teenagers. And so huh. I talked about how that shift in the culture happened. And so I, you know I have to ask, because you need to know if you've got something coming up with the um, Osmonds? I would so love I've, been, to, I've been trying to get him to like <laughs> I would love to do an episode on the Osmonds. I mean that would be an incredible episode. Um so tr trust me, I'm gonna come back to you on that. Um, <laughs> this this one has other brothers, though. So I, I do on this on this teen pop episode, I do interview uh Taylor Hansen from Hansen. So that's awesome. And and he's great. He's turned out to be a great, a great adult. You know, he was a great kid and now he's a great adult. That is you know, that's another thing that I'm really curious about is what is the difference between, maybe you could do an episode on this, what's the difference between someone who is able to navigate success, successfully into adulthood from being a teen pop star to someone who, you know, just really kind of crashes and burns in some ways? I'd love to understand more about that. Yeah, I think that's a really fascinating subject, and we touch upon it a little bit, actually, in this uh, 90s pop podcast, because one of the fascinating things, fascinating things about Hanson is that they opted out. Like after that first big album, they basically said, we don't really want this. We want to do <laughs> They did it themselves? Yeah, they, and they really just decided to go out on the road and just become a really good live band. And they thought that that's gonna actually help them have a longer career than just some teen pop thing. And mm -hmm. they and they did that. And we talk a lot about it, what that yeah. meant for them and for you know for that music and everything um, on the podcast. But it's, wow. but it's an interesting decision that they made. At the time, having been there, I can tell you that the record company was very upset. You know, because oh, I'm sure. Teen Pop Act, you want to put out another record very quickly because that audience grows up so fast and outgrows yeah. their teen idols. And um, they said, no, we're not going to do that. In fact, in fact, they went three years between their first album and their second album. Good for them. That is really interesting. You know, when you say that the audience outgrows the teen idol phase, it, I re was talking to Uncle Donnie the other day and he was kind of just like reminiscing on his career. And he was like, you know, I went from being able to fill jam packed stadiums, puppy love, to being in my twenties and not even able to fill a, an elementary school gym. And he's like, how did I get here? And so he went back to California and back to um, LA 
tried to like reinvent himself. Luckily it worked and was able to make a great adult career out of it too. But it really just kind of emphasizes that point that the appetite for that kind of music can go so quickly. So I think what happens is you probably, most people don't like, you know, when they're seniors in high school, they probably don't like what they like when they were freshmen in high school. You know, yeah, you absolutely. Almost embarrassed of the person you were when you were a freshman in high school, you know, and you want to as much distance totally. between yourself and that as you can. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's definitely true. So anyway, I, I think it's fascinating to talk, talk with you about this. And what I love about your podcast is that you not only will like talk about the music itself, but all of the historical and political and, you know, interesting conditions behind it that was able, that were able to, you know, create the phenomenon. So how do we, how do we get to the podcast? Can you tell our viewers like where to go to listen? Sure. The podcast is called Speed of Sound and you can go anywhere that you can get podcasts. You can find it. You can find it at Apple Podcasts. You can find it on Spotify. You can find it on the iHeart Radio app because iHeart actually are the producers of the podcast. So you can really, anywhere that you found any other podcast, that's where you can find this one. Okay, great. Well, well, and I can't wait for the next one. And I really highly recommend that everybody go out and listen. I literally look forward to Tuesdays so I can hear the newest <laughs> episode. It's, it's yeah. really super, Steve. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will be right back.